us. Great. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's presentation of Law at the Library, uh, a partnership between the Evanston Public Library, the Chicago Public Library, and the Chicago Bar Association. My name is Lorena Neal. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the legal literacy librarian at the Evanston Public Library. Uh, we're delighted to have everyone here tonight to discuss this evening's topic, Transaffirming Legal Services at Transformative Justice Law Project of Illinois. Uh, our presenters tonight will be staff members at PJLP. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the format for this evening, and then we'll get things started. Uh, I will introduce our speakers, who will then give their presentation, uh, followed by a question and answer period. Uh, so if you do have any questions for our speakers, uh, please feel free to type them into the Q&A window, which you will find near the bottom of your screen, um, or you can also use the chat feature to ask your questions as well. Um, I'll collect your questions as they come up and give our presenters the opportunity to answer them at the end. Uh, so feel free to add your questions whenever you think of them. Uh, and if you have any technical issues or questions, uh, feel free the, to direct those uh, to me in the chat window as well. Um, our next season of Law at the Library will resume in September. Uh, so stay tuned for updates on our upcoming topics, which you'll find um, on our legal resources page. Uh, you can also see videos of previous topics uh, covered in the Law at the Library series on the Evanston Public Library YouTube page, uh, this presentation included. Uh, I will post a link to this YouTube playlist in the chat uh, if you're interested in pursuing that. Um, I'll also post the link to uh, Evanston Public Library's LGBTQIA plus resource page um, and to our legal resources page as well in case you're looking for additional information on either of those topics. Uh, so our speakers tonight from TJLP are Maul Parker, Parker Kafka, uh, who is the staff attorney, uh, Desi Gillen. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, you can correct me as soon as you're, you're up on the stage here. Uh, but Desi is the program and impact coordinator uh, and Alexis Martinez, the admin and court support coordinator. Uh, before we get to them though, uh, I'm going to open the floor to Skip Harsh, who is the director of the Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity at the American Bar Association uh, for a few words. Uh, so welcome again, and thank you for being here. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. And I just wanna say from the Chicago Bar Association, a heartfelt thank you to um, everyone that has joined us today from the Transformative Justice Law Project of Illinois. Um, I have the pleasure right now of sitting uh, on the board of managers for the Chicago Bar Association, and we're excited to um, bookend uh, Pride Month with this program. Uh, at the beginning of the month, we uh, held a virtual webinar on LGBTQ plus courtroom etiquette. Um, and uh, I suggest, uh, if you can, to go to the Chicago Bar Association's webpage. It will be free for a couple of more days to view. And then I think after Pride Month is over, we may be putting it behind a paywall, but don't quote me on that. Um, so again, thank you. I hope you enjoy this program. Um, the CBA does have a number of resources, as does the American Bar Association um, on transgender rights. Uh, so I urge you to check out both associations' web pages. And um, happy Pride for a couple of days, a couple more days. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the folks. Um, from uh, TJLP. Hey everyone, um, thanks so much for having us. We are really excited to be here. Um, we are the Transformative Justice Law Project of Illinois. Um, and yeah, just a little bit about what we're gonna get into today. Um, so you get to know us a little bit, a um, little bit more about who our clients are. We're going to discuss some of the issues and barriers that trans and gender expansive folks are facing, and then go into a little bit about how you can support. And then, of course, the questions and answers um, towards the end. Okay. And please forgive me, my computer is going just like glitching a little bit, so it might be a little behind at different points. Um, but just an introduction about who we are. Um, we provide free legal services, education, advocacy through the state of Illinois for all trans, non-binary, and gender expansive people. We work in collaboration with those most impacted by the criminal justice system, our community members who are poor, street-based, um, BIPOC, 
immigrant, youth, and or disabled. We believe in our collective liberation and a world without police, prisons, and oppressive systems. And we will never stop loving or fighting for trans people. Um, and so, yeah, my name is Desi. Um, I go by they, them pronouns. I'm the program and impact coordinator. And I'll just have uh, my other two colleagues share a little bit who they are um, and what their roles are. Hi, my name is Mal Parker Kafka. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I'm the staff attorney at TJLP. I've been an attorney for um, just about eight years. I started out as a public defender in Florida, and then I went to the ACLU of Idaho, um, and then the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. So I've hopped around a little bit across the country, um, but I'm super excited to be here with you all tonight. And Alexis, I'll pass it to you. Hi, my name is Alexis Martinez. You know, um, the primary function uh, or the role that I play in TJLP is that I'm court, court support, you know, uh, for people when they go to court and then post hearings, you know, get them all their documentation and everything. You know, I have a long, long history, uh, you know, of activism and this is sort of like the culmination. Awesome. So just a little bit more about our history. Um, we already put the who we are today on the last slide, but a little bit more about our story. And um, we were founded in 2008 to fill the urgent need for holistic abolitionist criminal legal services for transgender and gender nonconforming people in Illinois and to address gaps in the mainstream LGBTQ um, civil rights movement. Um, and so, yeah, and we'll get into this a little bit um, more in a second, but um, a lot of our work is grassroots and relies on community based um, relationship building strategies um, to support our work and to um, guide a lot of the work that we, we do. Um, so just a little bit more about the political philosophies that um, that feed our work um, and that provide frameworks to the work that we do. Um, so the first is the abolition of the prison industrial complex. Um, so prison abolition is a movement to create lasting alternatives to the punishment based um, institutions, such as prisons, jails, juvenile, immigrant and military detention centers um, to actualize community safety. Um, instead of consenting to this false and fear-based need for prisons, we as abolitionists invest our energy in community empowerment, community-led education, radical activism, transformative justice, and liberations as necessary um, alternatives to the prison system and methods to make prisons obsolete. Um, so when you think of the prison um, industrial complex, it's not just the police, it's not just the military, but it's also, um, you know, ideologies like patriarchy and white supremacy, and then other ways that the media feeds into that, where it could be like, um, you know, corporate media interests or like, you know, um, soap operas about like police officers and, you know, um, and the way they, they treat folks. And so there's a, the prison industrial complex surrounds us and we see it manifest in many different ways um, through whether it's policing and surveillance or um, the media that we consume. And then transformative justice. Um, so generation five defines transformative justice as one survive, survivor safety, healing and agency, two accountability and transformation of those who abuse and cause harm, three, community response and accountability, and four, transform, transformation of the community and social conditions that create and perpetuate violence, um, including systems of oppression, exploitation, domination, and state violence. Um, so we believe in you know, large rallies or marches um, where we are, you know, making a stand about what is important in our rights um, and what we deserve as citizens and as human beings. Um, and we also believe that, you know, those 
little meetings with clients, those like consistent check-ins with people in your community are just as important um, and provide the foundation for accountability and transformation um, and addressing these really harmful systems that um, surround us every day. Um, so the third is trauma and healing informed. Um, so we know we meet clients who come from a wide range of lived experiences. While each client has different needs and goals, we understand the pervasive nature of trauma and provoke, promote environments of healing um, and harm reduction. So because all state institutions are inherently oppressive and connected to systems of criminalization and domination, um, including social welf welfare, we see direct legal services not as a solution, but a form of harm reduction. Um, we wanna help our um, clients navigate a lot of these systems and uh, without seeing the systems as the solution. Um, we don't seek legal services as a solution um, for justice, um, but we help our clients um, alleviate the burden of having to navigate these really harmful and tedious bureaucracies um, by providing them with resources, one-on-one um, -on -one meetings, trainings, different um, educational tools and whatnot. Um, and then last but not least, gender self-determination. Um, and so for me, this is one of my favorite ones um, because I really believe in um, empowerment and believe that um, with empowerment comes um, liberation and a collective liberation. Um, and we believe in the rights of individuals and communities have full power over their own lives, um, especially their gender identities, free from limitation. Um, so it doesn't matter if someone's coming to us just once or five times, um, to change their name, for instance, um, we will support them. You know, we will provide them with resources because um, we believe in that gender self-determination and bodily autonomy. Okay. Um, and so just a little bit more about what we do um, and how we manifest some of these frameworks and the goals that we have as an organization. Um, so we have uh, one of our, our flagship program, the name change mobilization and identity document updates. And Alexis, you can totally piggyback off of me when it, with the identity document updating as well. Um, so the name change mobilization um, we have a, we have virtual offerings for one-on-one -on -one support, and we also provide um, in-person legal clinics. And that's where we will provide pro se support um, to petitioners. We'll help them every step of the way when it comes to filling out paperwork, as well as filing, making sure all the like all the requirements are in, um, and uh, accompanying them to their hearing. Um, and then Alexis plays a really vital role in supporting them with updating identity documents. Um, and Alexis, if you want, you can speak more around, around that piece as well. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I find is that um, we have to keep that human approach open uh, and still fulfill our core values, you know, and every person, and I, at my age, I'm still learning, you know, to, to, to uh, uh, deal with the different personalities and everything, you know, and, and to be able to sort of discern, you know, the sensitivities and everything. So um, I try to gauge each person as an individual, you know, when they come to you. And when you go into these things, it's... Um, You know, you want to make sure that the person feels supported when they go into a courtroom. So, you know, we've been developing more and more techniques and processes and everything to ensure that clients get this these benefits. And a lot of it, a lot of it is is people have never been in front of a judge before, or or they've been in front of judges and been abused. You know, um, so to me the the, the process that, or the, 
the main function that we serve is to you know, be informed about the judges that they're going to go in front of, let our clients know, you know, um, and the, uh, the primary function, I think my job is to do that. After the hearings, you know, we make sure that they're, um, they have the birth certificate information, uh, depending on what state they're in and everything. And, uh, you know, DMV, if it's possible, I go to the DMV with them. You know, uh, I notarize their birth certificate material, you know, and I keep following up afterwards, you know, uh, that, that, that aspect of it is very important. If we could do that with other legal services, it would be great, you know, but, you know, I think the mobilization serves as a real good model for what can eventually become, you know, part of uh, what I see, you know, and Again, I know it, it's not ideal, but it is harm reduction. Yeah, and just to go off of that, um, just a little bit more context, Illinois has one of the most restrictive name change laws in the country. And um, a part of these restrictions are these really um, tedious requirements that folks have to meet um, when they are you know, trying to do something as simple yet powerful as a name change. Um, and so, um, yeah, like Alexis was saying, supporting them every step of the process and, you know, relationship-based um, support, um, trying to, yeah, I think bridge that gap of uh, trying to help them navigate these systems. Um, and then going into educational resources and trainings. So um, we provide these, uh, we provide name change one-on-one trainings um, to especially like libraries have been a really big supporter at bringing us, bringing us on for name change one-on-one trainings. Um, know your rights. We did an expungement and sealing um, training um, last year, which was really fun. And we did that with, in partnership with Chicago House. Um, and Elizabeth Ricks, and Elizabeth Ricks there. Um, and so, yeah, and then um, trying to provide more educational resources and trainings, whether it's just like folks coming in and, you know, we're walking them through the steps of a name change or us, you know, helping provide some sort of handbook or toolkit for folks to be able to like know how to do this on their own and feel more prepared to do name changes and other legal services. Um, and then just going into the activism and coalition building and policy and advocacy. Um, so we have, we have a lot of this on prisoners rights, sex worker rights, access to name changes again. So um, uh, one of our biggest, um, you know, things that we support is this HB 2542 um, bill that we have um, and one of the goals or the biggest goal is to help um, make name changes more accessible to folks um, and alleviating a lot of these barriers um, that are in place in Illinois when it comes to name changes. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Maul um, for litigation. Thanks, I just put in the chat um, a link to the ACLU of Illinois page um, talking about HB 2542 for, for your information. Um, would love your support on that. Uh, for our litigation aspects of our you know, lit litigation, we have a federal lawsuit right now pending in the Seventh Circuit. We sued um, the Cook County uh, Chief Judge Sullivan and then Judge Taylor took over for Sullivan um, and then uh, State Attorney Kim Fox for um, enforcing the unconstitutional name change law uh, statute, which bars uh, people with certain criminal convictions from ever changing their name or having a really long waiting period after a felony sentence has been completed. We also provide some support in expungement and sealings and clemency. Um, and then with our name change work, um, I do quite a bit of public of publication waivers. So presenting evidence to the judge, um, explaining the risks people face if they have to put their name change information in the newspaper for those three consecutive weeks. And um, we've been getting more and more successful um, in educating the judges about their, their, their discretion and ability to grant these waivers of publication. That's a little bit about our litigation. Uh, could I jump in? You know, 
uh, I started uh, hearing, uh, going to name change hearings about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's about a dozen judges, you know, in the civil division that do name changes. And we basically train those judges, nearly all of the judges, you know, into like, um, you know, uh, calling people by their chosen names. There's still a few that don't, but, you know, um, they're very receptive. And as, as Maul was saying, is that they're beginning to be more liberal in the interpretations of how they interpret the, um, the statute regarding publication waivers, you know, uh, so they're listening, listening to our arguments and everything. And it, it used to be that we had only one judge that would grant publication waivers. Now we have a second judge that it, it's, it's stepping into, you know, and a third, you know, so we're getting there little by little. And that's one of the reasons that people having that team around them that pushes them through is, is so important. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten to know all the judges and the, the thing I tell every lawyer, get to know the clerks, get to know the clerks because they, they, they're, they're, all, they're the ones that will cut through the, the jungle uh, uh, and the weeds and everything to get you what you need. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. but, you know, learning who, who the clerks are and who the judges clerks are and you know just the, the the little machinations that go on it's important 100 percent. and i'm a we're going we can move on that like glides us really great into the issues and barriers as well so yeah so the, there's many issues and barriers that trans and gender expansive folks experience um in and outside of systems um, but to start us off, um, you know, when a trans person becomes incapacitated um, due to health issues or passes away, um, we have seen in the community family of origin, dead naming our, our you know, the, the person that's passed away, um, making decisions about their memorials um, that we know the person would never have wanted. Um, that type of thing. And so we're really trying to figure out a way to um, expand services of creating wills and powers, power of attorney for trans and gender expansive folks so that the way their body is handled, their memorial, decisions about their lives, um, you know, health decisions and whatnot, um, what happens to their property after they pass, that kind of thing. It's so important um, that they're honored in the ways they deserve and, and want to be. Um, and so, but, it, you know, creating a will, power of attorney is incredibly intimidating. And people think, you know, I only, you know, I have a one bedroom apartment, like who cares, you know, do, do I even qualify for a will, right? Like people just don't have that information. And um, we really feel strongly that these types of um, these types of um, documents, these legal documents should be um, more accessible to folks for trans folks in the community um, so that, you know, what happens to them after their death or in a situation where they can't advocate for themselves that, um, that their intention, that their intentions of what should happen are followed. Um, I could go on about this, but this is a short presentation. So um, we could go on to healthcare. So transphobia is alive, alive and well in healthcare. Um, you know, access to gender affirming care is, is absolutely vital to our well being and our ability to thrive uh, related to name changes. You know, when somebody cannot um, get their name changed and they have to suffer through, you know, a waiting room in the dentist's office with their dead name or current legal name on it, which outs them as trans, which is unsafe, a violation of a person's privacy, and quite frankly, embarrassing. It, it, you know, people decide, not, you know, their safety, is more important than um, 
you know, their yearly cleaning, but that has long-term effects eventually on our health and our well-being when we can't access gender affirming care excuse me and that doesn't only include just medical care it's also eye exams dentist um going into the social security office or you know getting government benefits and stuff like that if if they can't do it in their in their chosen name in the name that resonates um with their gender identity expression, um, gender expression, um, it's a, it's a real issue. Anybody I'm else? Gonna, I'm going to piggyback off yeah. of that, you know, and I'll just say it. I was at Howard Brown today to pick up prescriptions and they insisted on calling me Arthur, which was my dead name. Okay. And I've been through this with them. I says, there's no law that says you have to, I says, you know, the prescription has to come under my legal name because the insurance is under my, uh, my spouse's um, name, but there's no reason why Howard Brown, which is one of the biggest, you know, LGBTQ uh, organizations needs to dead name me, you know, and I, I, I've written letters to them and everything, but it, it's like I'm saying, if they're doing it in our organizations, think about how it is to somebody that's opposed to us, you know? So I, I just want to say that, uh, I, uh, four years ago or three years ago, I, I was at Ellen Masonic for emergency surgery and they dead named me. And the last time, last year I was in there for another surgery and everybody, even the cleaning people called me Alexis. Okay. Which was my legal name, you know, and evidently they instituted a program, you know, where they, they, they can just, your name pops up on the computer. And, you know, and it's like the name that's on your insurance card is not what they necessarily will call you. And there's just simple things that people can do. It does, you're not locked. There's no law that says you have to call somebody by their dead name. Yeah. And um, so it, it, it's these sort of things that we need to like actively and not the word. No, we radically need to do this because these are simple things that are very harmful to trans people. Yeah. You know, it it hurt today when somebody insisted on calling me that. Yeah. You know, uh, so um, it, it's it's something that I, I really want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alexis. Mm -hmm. What I'm so sorry that happened. Um, that's terrible. But you know, it's you're right that it just there needs to be a radical commitment to to doing away with those um old concepts of like what should what people can say when you know they're calling out a name um would you transition us into the housing any like the issues of housing um that trans folks experience alexis um let me see can you hear me yeah okay i thought i would turn the mic off there for a second but and again this is just the other day, I had a, a friend call me. They're moving back to Chicago. They're trans, and they they're, they're, they still have their old name because they're um, they were convicted of uh, prostitution about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So you know they show up in an apartment with, and you know they they use their chosen name, and the landlord immediately just said no. <laughs> You know, yeah. but it, 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 this is routine. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've seen it happen on my block. Okay. So um, housing is a real issue. And if you just look at statistics, I, I believe 30% of homeless youth are, are, you know, in the queer spectrum, you know, and they, they, they can't find agencies to support them because they're too young. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they have other issues, you know, uh, HIV status mm -hmm. in, makes it harder for you to, you know, to, to find people that will, your credit, if your credit isn't up to date, you know, social security cards, you know, they, mm -hmm. they do background checks on everybody now. So if you have any, it's like, uh, there's a point system and no. you just, you just get, you know, uh, that's why you have trans people living in small groups together, you know, because one will get an apartment and then they'll start to share it because 
that's the, a survival technique. And mm -hmm. again, I know little groups of, of primarily trans women that do this, yeah. you know. Um, and as soon as as soon as they're able to get a job, you know, part of part of it it, it it all ties together. If you can't get a place to stay, it's hard to get a job. It's, it's just to keep yourself clean and presentable becomes an issue. So there, there's all of these things, like they piggyback off of each other, you know, housing, uh, employment. Um, the biggest complaint that I get is, I'll get people calling me all the time about not being able to get their employer, you know, to change their name. You know, there's always, oh, you'll have to wait till next year because the IRS has your old name, you know, and they sort of like make up law that doesn't exist. Okay. You know, um, and a lot of it is, you know, um, something that an attorney is not going to take that on, you know, and I, so, so what you, you have these people, there's got to be a way that we can educate employers. Okay, not to put these kind of barriers in the way, you know. Um, how well housing? I've already said, you know. But just like I said about Illinois Masonic, it took a very angry letter from me, you know, and, and some of my like activist reputation to to get them to change something, you know. And there was a few other people that joined the letter. And they changed this. Okay, so sometimes what it is is us being activists, you know, uh, and acting in a radical manner when we see an issue that uh, uh, you know blocks us from our civil rights. You know, and that when I talk about being radical, you know, is to be unapologetic for you know supporting who you are, you know, because it. It's your life, literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Alexis. Um, and I mean, you just summed it up really well too. And and just the multi, we're all multi-dimensional people, and we all, um, and the more uh, identities, uh, marginalized identities, you hold. Um, the more challenging it'll be to navigate a world that is built for, you know, white, um, cis, able-bodied, um, and people who have money, you know? <laughs> um, and so uh, we know, and we all know that um, there is just a wave of legislation and um, on anti-trans legislation legislation on top of um, the surveillance and state violence that trans folks, black and brown trans folks in particular, black and brown trans women in particular have to face on a daily basis. Um, black and brown trans um, femme folks, folks who are um, more likely to have, because of their circumstances, be closer to police surveillance and be punished for different life-saving choices or survival choices that we we that they have to make and that um, we all have to make in different ways. Um, but we may have more access and more resources to make these um, choices in our lives. So, um, so yeah, they're all connected and all building off of each other. Um, and just to go into, um, I know we're a little bit over a 30 minute time, but you cannot talk about all of these things in 30 minutes. I don't know what y'all are thinking. No, I'm just like, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm gonna just go to, if my computer allows me, which it may not, but um, at some point, there are ways that you can donate and um, support mutual aid efforts. You can donate to tjlp.org. Um, there's a link that, if my computer uh, figures itself out, um, it'll show where you can also look for, look at different mutual aid um, groups that uh, where you can, you know, donate money. And that's, you know, that's something you can do today. Um, it's something that you can do every day. 
But of course, um, like I was mentioning before, there are the, you know, marches and rallies that you can come and support um, in support of bodily autonomy, in support of trans rights. Um, it's all connected. What's going on today with Roe versus Wade is connected to bodily autonomy, is connected to gender self-determination, um, is connected to um, Black Lives Matter and um, supporting um, social movements all over the US. So think about ways that you can support these really big efforts and then also ways that you can support and build relationships in your own life um, uh, in little ways that make a really big impact. Um, and I would like to add one thing to that, okay? You know, you have the Chicago Bar Association, the American Bar Association, you have a whole host of like legal expertise that, you know, you need to start openly and, uh, you know, um, lending some of that support to the trans community, you know, in the areas of like criminal, uh, uh, criminal lawyering and uh, expungements and all of that, you know, there's an awful lot of uh, pro bono stuff that you guys can do you know, that we, you know, we need to call you out on that, okay? At least I do. Awesome. But you can donate time, okay? Absolutely. Yes, Lorena, is there any, are there any questions that have come in or do folks have any questions for us? Hi there, so yes, we do have um, a question to kick off with here, if I can get myself back to the, the right spot. Um, and this is from one of our participants. Um, and the question is, uh, I was born in Massachusetts, assigned male at birth, moved to Virginia and married my wife there prior to identifying as a transgender woman. And then I moved to Illinois where I plan on getting all my legal stuff moved over. Plus I had a natural born child prior to becoming sterile. What sort of complications uh, does a person need to be aware of in this situation? Yeah, Ma, you're muted. Yeah, you're, yeah. Thanks. Um, so there are a number of, number of things to, to think about, um, but you know it really depends on each state's laws. For instance, Illinois just passed the law that allows people to update their name on their marriage certificates. That is not possible in any other state other than Illinois and California. And then you have things to think about with like birth certificates. So your name is on your child's birth certificate, um, dep depending on the state where that your child was born, will determine if you can update you know, your name on their birth certificate. You could do that in Illinois, but you can't do it in most states. Um, but yeah, if you've lived in Illinois for six continuous months and you have no criminal convictions that would um, bar you from changing your name, you can absolutely change your name in Illinois. You can reach out to us with any questions um, or, you know, to get support. But each, um, e each case is, you know, specific to the person's circumstances. So to get all of your answers or all of your questions answered accurately, um, we would just want you to do a consult with us so we could do some research and advise you in the best way possible. Great, thank you so much for that response. Um, we do have another question um, from an attendee who is a paralegal um, and wants to know uh, more ways that people can get involved in the longer term activism and coalition building rather than just one-off protests and ways people without a law degree can donate their time. Yeah, so, I mean, there's volunteering with TJLP. Um, you can email, uh, I know that we have a volunteer registration form online um, on our website. Um, and you can always email name change at TJLP um, if you have any, uh, like requests or any, you know, any questions around how to get involved. Um, our name, our email name change at TGLP is right here. Um, and then, I mean, there are so many, you know, I, I mean, Chicago community jail support is just one I can think of off the top of my head that is a collective that does a lot of great 
work um, with uh, folks leaving, just getting out of Cook County Jail. Um, I know that they um, go through waves with accepting volunteers. Um, I think if you follow them on Instagram or Twitter, um, you may be able to like um, catch on to one of those volunteering waves. Um, yeah, there's like just, I mean, there's uh, Black and Pink where you can support with letter writing to folks who are currently incarcerated inside um, jails and prisons all throughout the US. Um, we we want to develop, you know, that's one of our goals is to develop our own um, or, re, you know, reintroduce uh, uh, communication with folks on the inside um, as a study practice within TJLP. So you can always follow us on TJ at, on Instagram, excuse me, or Facebook, and always just get in updates, you know, on if we're accepting more volunteers for um, name change mobilization or anything else. Um, but yeah. Great, thank you so much for that answer. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, Desi, um, after the program, if you wanted to send uh, some of these links to me uh, for some of these organizations, uh, and of course for, for your organization as well, um, I'd be happy to, to send that out to the list of attendees uh, so they have that handy uh, for them and can pass pass that on to their, their family and friends. So we'd, we'd love to, to help share that afterwards. And on that note, I would like to plug, I'm gonna stick here in the chat. Uh, Evanston Public Library has an event tomorrow um, for um, erasing, uh, it's an erase event. It's in cooperation with the Moran Center uh, here in Evanston. Uh, and it's helping to get um, evictions and other certain criminal convictions off of people's records uh, to make it easier for people to find housing. Uh, so that's going to be taking place tomorrow, or tomorrow, sorry, Thursday. I've lost track of what day I'm on. Uh, Thursday from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, at the Robert Crown uh, Community Center, uh, which is our, our location on the south side of Evanston. Uh, so the link that's in the chat there uh, will take you to to that the all the information about that event um, and it is walk in you don't need appointments you don't need to make any preparations ahead of time um, so just wanted to plug that and get that in there a um, couple other questions uh, that we've had uh, I know that you said that you are working on having uh, more services available for people who need you know, wills powers of attorney for finances or health care um, for housing issues um, but you know, you you need to build up. You know, obviously, <laughs> there's there's only so much that that a small group of people can do. Do you have any other organizations that you want to share with us um, that people can can talk to if they're having issues with this? Places they can look for more information on on how to get these services accomplished. Yeah, I mean, I would plug Chicago House. Um, they have the Trans Lifeline. Um, legal services, Elizabeth Ricks um, does a lot of employment, um, housing and medical discrimination for trans folks. Um, so I would love to plug her work. Also Joey Carrillo at the um, Chicago Legal Aid. Mm -hmm. um, Joey is uh, leading on an LGBTQ uh, um unit or you know a uh, section of the legal services uh, Chicago legal, legal services and doing a lot around uh, domestic violence intimate partner violence um, you know orders of protection that type of stuff and also providing support on um, school just you know academic education um, school discrimination for queer and trans youth um, mm -hmm. so I would love to, yeah those are those are two great referrals that we um, Refer, refer folks to all the time. Yeah. Great, thank you. And we do have uh, at BPL, I put in the, the links there, we do have an LGBTQIA plus resources page uh, where TJLP is listed along with other organizations uh, in the Chicago area um, that you know, help you with legal issues, with social services issues. Um, so I will I will make sure to update with uh, with those, those organizations as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, another question, uh, I'm interested in your your education and what people can do uh, as individuals and uh, as institutions uh, to advocate better for trans affirming care, trans affirming services. Uh, you know, either within their places of employment, the institutions they're affiliated with, in their own lives. 
Yeah, um, so we do provide um, trans affirming and legal services training um, that I think touches, uh, you know, we can't do in an hour and a half, there's only so much you can say, but it does touch on different client-centered approaches that we have. Um, I mean, a lot of our work comes down to being client-centered. Um, I, I mean, especially with legal services, like, um, you know, we don't need to know like everything in terms of like queer theory or like, um, you know, uh, uh, political philosophies, like th these are things that, of course, educate yourself on, of course, like, you know, pick up the new Jim Crow by um, Michelle Alexander, or like, you know, um, different uh, works. Uh, I know Alok, uh, I'm forgetting their last name, but they just released a book too on like queer history. There's like a bunch of stuff out there. But of course, like being client centered, um, treating your colleagues with respect, you know, like if someone is saying, hey, I want to go by this name, re looking at your policies, looking at what really needs to stay, what is, you know, what you're, what, um, if you're holding on to something because of a bias um, and a privilege that you have and, and just because of um, the power that you have that you really like, or is it because of like, there's some, something that is legitimate and uh, real um, that is preventing you from, you know, um, had, like like acknowledging someone's name that they go by, you know, like um, I really can't think of anything that is like that would, you know, really legitimately like have someone just go like call someone by their their dead name or their current legal name when they want to be called a different name and they work for your organization, you know. Um, it's something that's simple, it's something that's powerful. Um, and so, yeah, I would say like looking at your policies, looking at, you know, being client-centered, being, um, you know, treating your employees like, like human beings um, and yeah. I mean, that's just off the top of my head, like there's so much out there um, that you can dive into, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, making intake forms um, inclusive of current legal name and name that a person goes by um, and pronouns, um, making sure you have all gender bathrooms at your office space, in your office space, um, accessible bathrooms. Um, you know, those are just uh, in addition to, to what you were saying, Desi, as well. Mm -hmm. Alexis, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I think that a lot of the, a lot of organizations, you know, that um, you know, like they'll have Black Lives Matter on plastered on the windows and they'll have, you know, the, 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 the pride flag and everything, you know, and then they just, you know, do all of the things that, uh, you know, harm, harm the people in the community that, that they're supposed to be, you know, uh, and I, again, this is stuff that I've experienced firsthand, you know, where somebody says, you know, you know, your voter registration says, you know, Arthur. I go, no, I says, I changed it. Here's the new card. And it's, you know, and that's another thing that happened today. They asked me for multiple IDs because and I had all the stuff with me, you know, and then finally somebody says, no, I know Alexis, let them vote, <laughs> you know. So it, it's, these, these are, people say, oh, they immediately say, oh, I apologize, you know, da, 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 you know, but it's like, if you're running an organization or, you know, you need to educate the people, you need to, it's a simple thing to educate workers, you know, you tell them, no, we're not going to accept, you know, if, if you don't like being around queer people or trans people or whatever, right, that's, you keep that outside of here, I says, you know, and, um, a lot of people say, oh, I was only joking, you know, and it isn't, you know, it isn't a joke. These are harmful things, you know. Uh, and for a long time, you know, because I'm so old, you know, uh, I'm in my 70s, okay? And so in my generation, it was, everything was he and her, that was it. Anything 
other than that, you know, was unacceptable. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a product of that generation, you know, so it, it's, I'm still in the learning process. So I know it's not an easy thing, but it's like that word I, I love using, we have to be radical about it. You're not going to have change if, if you don't insist on every time, you know, and I, somebody says, sir, and I go, ma'am, you know, and, you know, until they get it at some point they'll get it you know um so, so I, mean, I just want to emphasize that, that it's important to be very active in in you know especially in the small things the small things become big things thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. we do have another question uh from a participant uh, what sort of resources should I look into to get my employer's health care benefits up to date on things? I've amassed a mountain of resources and documentation, but I want to have legal basis for things outside of medical and social justifications. And then as a follow on to that, uh, does the ADA cover gender dysphoria so as to be used to crowbar an employer into using your chosen name? Uh, is it a reasonable accommodation, for example? Yeah, I haven't done the research on the ADA. I mean, um, I know that um, each state is handling it differently um, with lawsuits. So I would need to do research on that and I haven't done that, but it is um, it is being used. Um, the ADA is being used as a way to get employers to use people's chosen names and uh, pronouns. Um, but in terms of Illinois, I'm not quite sure. I'm sorry about that. I just haven't done that research and I'm just going to be honest. I, the worst thing is when lawyers act like they know something when they totally do not. Um, so I'm not <laughs> going to do that. Um, in terms of the health care benefits, um, uh, I think most of that is, is pressure uh, from employees and really advocating for um, equity in access to um, uh, gender affirming health care. In every other organization I've been in, um, an employee in a nonprofit or whatever, I, we have pressured the board to um, adopt policies that say, if the health insurance does, if the health insurance company does not cover gender affirming services, then the organization will um, contribute uh, financially to you accessing that care. Um, so, you know, it, most of the time it is just putting pressure uh, on the board or administration of, of the organization um, in power um, to make sure that they have a more equitable healthcare policy that um, you know everyone can can thrive in the ways um, they deserve. So great, thank you so much for that answer. Yeah. Um, I don't see any others in the chat right now. We are getting close to seven o'clock. Uh, so if anyone else has anything to, to add, please go ahead and do so uh, at this time. Otherwise, I just wanted to both thank all of our, our presenters tonight uh, for being here and sharing your experiences with us and all this great information uh, and open the floor to you for, for anything you wanna say in closing. Well, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity you know, um, you know, I always feel very shy about being on camera and stuff, but, you know, I appreciate the opportunity and I hope that some of the things that I said uh, have, have an impact. Thank you very much. Yes, we really appreciate it. Thanks everyone for having us tonight. And um, of course, you can email namechange at tjlp.org if you have any more specific questions. Um, yeah, we would totally love to support you or reach out to folks who know the answer and can support. Yeah, that, that looks like, um, I think there's someone who's, who's writing out something. You might want to email TJLP directly with that um, so that they can give you a, a more complete answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone have a great evening hey, thank you Paul. thank you so much for joining us Absolutely. have a good night thank you get out of here <laughs>